anymore. So, okay, so I would actually like to take just a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about um, the guest that, or, or the speaker rather, that we have on tonight. Um, our speaker is Leslie Stevens. Um, Leslie has actually been involved in the world of pediatric sleep, breathing, and airway for over 35 years. As CEO and president of Healthy Start, Leslie is an international lecturer and trainer. Um, I don't think there's a question in the reference to the subject of pediatric sleep, breathing, and airway health that Healthy Starts and Healthy Starts Connection, rather, that she cannot answer. And really, when you have the backing of a company like Healthy Start by Orthotain, you have over 51 years, over 4 million cases, and tons of research to back you. You know, most importantly, she's the mother of three. And so her goal and desire is to provide every advantage for children to allow them to live healthy and happy lives. And one of the things you're going to learn tonight is that there is a silent epidemic affecting nine out of 10 children. Um, th this this epidemic manifests itself in a variety of symptoms that can be easily overlooked, misdiagnosed, and most unfortunately left untreated. So it's absolutely critical that children are evaluated for sleep and breathing habits. So Leslie's mission is to educate both parents and dental professionals to ensure children a lifetime of health, happiness, and success. So I'd actually like to take this time to hand the floor and the mic over to Leslie Stevens. Thank you so much, Susie. Um, I am so pleased to be here tonight, and um, I'm looking forward to obviously sharing, hopefully, a lot of knowledge um, for your doctors and um, getting them on the road to pediatric breathing, sleeping, and airway health. So tonight, we're gonna talk a little bit about what is sleep disorder breathing? Um, how do we identify? how do we evaluate, and most importantly, how we treat. Um, we'll go over some of the outward symptoms that we can identify and um, how we have that communication with parents. So sit back, relax. Um, I hope you have that aha moment tonight. Um, I, I wish I could um, see your faces because it is one of those presentations where Hopefully um, tonight I'll be able to connect some of the dots for you and you'll see what an amazing area of technology, new treatment, new ideas that has come about and how important it is you as a dental professional and the role you play in helping these children become healthier, happier, and obviously, um, be able to have a lifetime worth of success. So as you're all probably aware, the ADA has played a big role in this um, sleep conversation. Um, they actually created policy, um, now it's been almost a year and a half. It was a year ago last October. And basically it is the responsibility for each dentist to be educated in sleep, breathing and airway. Also identify and be able to screen for um, sleep issues as well as deficiencies in growth and development. So it's really important that at least you're aware and there's nothing more important than at least educating your parents, your patients in regard to this area um, as part of the responsibility of being a dental professional. So when we talk about sleep disorder breathing, it is truthfully an epidemic. Nine out of 10 children will have one or more of these outward symptoms. And these outward symptoms include mouth breathing, snoring, teeth grinding, swollen adenoids and tonsils, chronic allergies, eczema, asthma, ADD, ADHD, aggressive behavior, depression, irritability, anger, peer problems, few friends, bedwetting, difficulty in school, especially in the subjects of math, science, and spelling, delayed or stunted growth, restless sleep, nightmares, morning headaches, daytime drowsiness, frequently waking up at night, sleep talking and walking. This is a silent crisis among our children. Typically, um, when we look at all those outward symptoms, um, we understand that parents will identify typically each of those symptoms independent of others. And parents will go to a specialist to have this symptom addressed or another specialist for another one of those symptoms. And many of those specialists are basically addressing them 
by drugs of different varieties, psychiatric testing, counseling, therapy, surgery, sleep studies, and the list goes on and on. The problem with addressing these outward symptoms in that fashion is many times we're just addressing the symptoms alone and not the root cause. Um, many times these medications or different testing provide only short-term short band-aids. Um, many times um, the treatment involves several drugs and many of them have side effects. And unfortunately, this can be costly, painful, time-consuming, and ineffective. So let's talk about what the root causes are of those outward symptoms and how maybe they relate to each other. So research over the past 20 years has linked each of these outward symptoms to a root cause. And these root causes include mouth breathing, narrow palate, improper tongue placement, and jaw relationships. So how do we screen for sleep? What's the first step? Well, first take a physical, basically um, inventory of what you can identify just by observing a child. So if you look at the girl here on the left, you already notice she has deep circles or what we call venous pooling. At the same time, you can see how her head is lurched forward. Many times kids do this, adults do it as well in order to increase airway. Um, the boy on the left, same. We see dark circles, that venous pooling. We see separation of the lips. We can probably be pretty confident he's a mouth breather. At the same time, we see that lip rolling which many times reflects an overject condition where probably the lower jaw is retrusive. Um, also, the boy looks rather heavy, almost like a double chin. Um, many times it's because of that lack of growth and development that kind of makes a child look heavy when they're not heavy, makes the condition almost look like a double chin. Also look at the profile of the child. We can look a lot at growth and development. So here are the girl on the left. Let's take a line that basically goes down and we see what that growth looks like. You can see how diminished her growth is in the lower mandible. Um, as the child, um, the profile looks, you can see a rolled lip, usually indicating an overjet, also allowing the lower jaw to be retrusive. You'll also see um, lips separated, tendency is for mouth breathing. The girl on the right, again, take a look at the profile. You can see the deficiency in that lower third. Um, you can also see that rolled lip, some separation, circles under the eyes, venous pooling. You also see what we call as a funnel look, meaning that the chin blends into the neck. There should be definition here with that child as that promotion of the forward growth occurs. So already you already can identify one, two, three, four different um, symptoms, outward signs, diminish growth and development in these children. The second tool and probably the most important tool is the Healthy Start Sleep Questionnaire. And what makes the Healthy Start Sleep Questionnaire so unique is it's gonna look at 27 of the most prevalent outward symptoms. And we're gonna ask a parent to basically review, identify, but then put a degree of severity for each of the symptoms that their child exhibits. So it's a very clear idea of what we see. So the first column will be the initial, meaning at the beginning of treatment. The second will be the follow-up. You will also see number 27 talks about speech problems. Typically, we see a lot of children, because of these deficiencies, their tongue is not in the proper place, um, the swallow is not active, um, maybe the tongue is laying low, the muscles in the tongue have not been basically conditioned, so it's very difficult for them to have the pronunciation that's necessary, and many children have speech problems. Um, I will say, just a helpful hint, maybe the question is, where is the tongue supposed to be? So a really good, um, quick test is to tell a parent, say the letter N. Where that sound ends where is where that tongue should be at rest. Um, maybe if you're doing this at home, you notice you have a problem as well. 
um, very typical. Um, obviously, none of us were directed or taught the proper way to swallow. Um, and this way, if the tongue is in the upper palate where it belongs at rest, there's only one way you can breathe, and that's through your nose. And that's what we're trying to identify to see if these children are actually breathing through their nose rather than their mouth. Um, here's an interesting study that was done on over 500 patients evaluating that sleep questionnaire and seeing what were the most prevalent conditions. Um, do we see relationships between the conditions? And um, basically the results that came about were mouth breathing and snoring are commonly associated with more sleep disorder breathing symptoms than any other symptom study. Nine out of 10 children had one or more outward symptoms of sleep disorder breathing. 60% of the sample had four or more outward symptoms. One out of five children experienced bedwetting. Um, I'm just gonna make an extra comment. Um, obviously, bedwetting is not the topic of conversation um, between parents or at school or things like that. It's something that obviously a family keeps very close to the chest and um, not very much information is shared between friends or neighbors or um, even colleagues or even the dental professional. But it's important to note that we will see 18.7% of children at an older age will still be bedwetting. So what does that mean? That means a classroom of 20 kids, we would anticipate four of them to be bedwetters. And we've realized that there is a relationship between sleep, breathing, and airway and bedwetting. So we'll talk about how we address this. And it's an important conversation. Um, when I talk to a parent, sometimes I'll talk in third person. If I talk in third person and just say, typically we see a lot of kids that will bedwet at a later age, I can immediately identify if a parent looks at the child, their eyes get bigger. Um, I'm here to try to make it um, a conversation of ease and um, approaching it sometimes from that direction helps the conversation. Um, the last item between the ages of four and 12, 92.6% of the outward symptoms did not self-correct while 30% worsened with age. This is such an important statistic, um, not only for you, but for a parent. Um, knowing that my child would have less than an 8% chance of improvement in these outward symptoms is going to change and maybe direct me into a treatment that would address these issues immediately. Why do I want to take a chance of that remaining the same or even getting worse? If I see it, I treat it. So an important statistic to remember. Um, here are some of the outward symptoms that we were looking at in the sleep, sleep questionnaire. You can see that mouth breathing is the number one outward symptom, and we see it in 43% of this sample. Um, the reason why, well, when you mouth breathe during sleep, just by opening the mouth by a half an inch, you actually reduce the airway by six millimeters. Well, a seven-year-old's airway is typically around seven millimeters which means the mouth breather who is seven years old could be spending the night trying to breathe through one millimeter of airway. Uh, that's not enough. What requires oxygen? REM sleep. Those children are not getting into REM sleep. The body is not getting enough oxygen. That child is not experiencing well, REM sleep. So that's the important linkage there when we talk about it. Also, if we see a child who is a mouth breather, we will see approximately eight other outward symptoms. And these most commonly um, associated outward symptoms include snoring, difficulty listening, often interrupts, talks while sleeping, allergic symptoms, fidgets with hands, restless sleep, teeth grinding, feels sleepy and or irritable during the day. What are the implications of this study? Well, the findings show that sleep disorder breathing is much more common and affects children even as young as two years of age. Begin treatment as early as possible to ensure permanent changes. Identify outward symptoms displayed in 90% of the children that enter your practice can significantly 
reduce this epidemic, and enable you to successfully treat the overall health of your patients. Hopefully that's your goal. Um, hopefully a Healthy Start will assist you and obviously benefit and change the trajectory of your pediatric patients. So airway, airway is addressing habitual issues. So let's talk about airway. We just talked about mouth breathing and um, by mouth breathing, we reduce the airway by seven millimeters. Well, having that discussion is basically the visual would probably be well associated with taking a garden hose and kinking it. Um, typically we express to a parent that the airway we're looking for for your child looks more like a garden hose. Unfortunately, if they're mouth breathing, we might be resulting in something more like a coffee stirrer. Well, I did an experiment one day and um, decided I was going to spend the day trying to breathe through a coffee stirrer so I could feel exactly what a child feels like if they mouth breathe all night long. So um, I lasted about 10 minutes, maybe 15, but I'll have to tell you I had the most massive headache I've ever had. I tried Excedrin, I tried eating, nothing helped. The only thing that rectified the situation was going to sleep that night and waking up in the morning. Now I had the benefit of having a normal airway where I was able to regain the oxygen, obviously probably go into REM sleep and repair and um, improve my headache issue. Um, unfortunately, think about a child. This mouth breathing occurs each and every night. Are they reducing their airway to one millimeter? Yeah, and probably it's happening tonight. It probably happens tomorrow night, probably happens the following night. Does a child have, or is the child equipped to explain that to a parent? Probably not. Would their behavior suggest that they're struggling? Absolutely. How many of us have seen the child hanging from the ceiling, jumping up and down, irritable, impulse, hitting kids, um, not listening? Um, I, I think you and I can agree that if we did not sleep or did not have that restful reparative sleep, each and every night, can you imagine what we would be like when we don't get one night's sleep? I can speak for myself. I might be a little cranky. I might be a little short. Um, these are things just because our body was not designed to function without sleep. So those are the conversation that's really important to address with the parent um, and make sure they understand that it's beyond a child's control. I always bring up the example of bedwetting. You know, I, I've had kids that say, oh, I'm not allowed to drink anything after four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, all sorts of different ways we try to help a child basically overcome a condition that is impacting them. And um, unfortunately, the bedwetting is one of those that is a beyond their control. It's the body's reaction to the lack of oxygen. And um, if we understand that, it's easier to be more compassionate with the child, but also to be maybe more helpful. And um, obviously, when we are able to address the mouth breathing, increase the oxygen that's coming by nasally breathing, um, we change that bedwetting. So that's the good news. Um, obviously, we have to understand, address, and be knowledgeable of that outward symptoms in order for us to be able to help treat it. Why is this epidemic occurring and why do we see this so often? Well, it has to do with basically our society. Um, more than likely, both parents work. What's the likelihood a mom is gonna be able to spend two years with their baby um, and be able to breastfeed them during that entire time? It's probably pretty rare. And um, the breastfeeding basically um, helps develop that oral cavity. And without it, what are we doing? We're substituting bottles. Many times breast milk is put into bottles. We use pacifiers. All of these um, tools or crutches, so to speak, depress the tongue. Um, it also causes a suction in the mouth that helps collapse those arches. So if we collapse the arches, obviously 
the palate is not large enough to accommodate the tongue. So the tongue can be resting in the proper place in the upper palate of the mouth. So instead it lays low. So you can kind of see how the compounding problem. Now, if the tongue is laying low, tendency is they're going to be mouth breathing. Another um, facet to this conversation is our diet and nutrition. Um, so often we are on a soft food diet, so we never have the ability to actually use that chewing motion to help develop the arches. So um, here's a great example, graduate puffs, the nutritious snack that melts in a baby's mouth. Amazing. <laughs> um, how many times do your children like a, maybe a steak that is grisly and they have to really chew it in order to swallow it? No, that's not going to happen. You remember how um, kids um, don't like to use um, their oral cavity basically to conduct that chewing motion. Um, sometimes we say back in the day when cavemen were here, we never had these issues. So maybe we should go back to chewing rocks. Well, I, I don't think we need to chew rocks, but maybe we can um, put a more nutritious, um, organic um, diet together um, to help our children. Um, again, we talk about what are visu visual cues that we have. Well, obviously, if a child has that prolonged um, pacifier, nipple bottle, and possibly even finger sucking, um, we realize that we tend to see more open bites. Um, obviously, this is an example of an open bite. You can also see probably a tongue thrust, obviously a mouth breather. So all of these, again, would go into those physical, physical characteristics um, that we would be able to identify and kind of give us a clue of other things that are going on. Um, just a quick overview, obviously understanding where the nasal cavity is, where the hard and soft palate, um, tongue position, airway, these are all parts of the anatomy that are important to get a grasp on. So when we're talking about it, we can kind of understand or explain, educate to a parent how that breathing occurs um, and um, how the development is so important. Um, we spend a lot of time tonight talking about mouth breathing. Well, the nose is critical. And why is the nose critical? Well, it has five functions. And these function include serves as an air passageway, warms and moistens inhaled air. Its um, membrane traps dust, pollen, bacteria, and other foreign matter. It contains receptors, which sort out odors. It aids in pronunciation and the quality of voice. These are all important properties that we want to make sure the nose is actually functioning in those respects. So um, we will be looking at that and identifying it um, in your future patients. How often do we see a child in a car seat, mouth open? Well, we know that in this study that we did, 43% of a sample of 500 actually were mouth breathers. So here's another example of a child in a car seat. Um, I want you to listen to Eli. Um, this is gonna kind of, I think, give you that aha moment, but really pay close attention to what was done for Eli at the end of this short little video clip and um, see the benefits that occurred. Now he's holding it. Ellen's holding it. He's still holding it. He's trying to take in air. There he goes. Okay, now watch. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's still holding his breath, and now he's going to gulp again. That was it again. And again, he's holding, he's holding, he's trying, there he goes. This has been three minutes and 15 seconds, and you can see how many episodes he's had of not getting calm breaths in. Now, watch what happens when I take his jaw, 
Can I just bring it forward? Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can. I hope that's the other way. Bring it the way forward. Right as I'm opening the airway, I'm going to draw forward ever so slightly. And now he's breathing through his nose quietly. His mouth is a little bit open, but he's breathing through his nose. This way. Here, I just think you don't hear him anymore. And I like that he's gently he's drawn forward. How amazing is that? How many children have you seen struggle to breathe? What if we could create a system that each and every night would be able to bring that lower jaw forward or prevent that lower jaw from drifting back, preventing the mouth breathing, encouraging the nasal breathing, but then also provide that myofunctional therapy within that appliance to lift the tongue, create the proper swallow, allow the tongue to start the expansion of the arches, as well as addressing the crossbite, the teeth grinding, all of those other outward symptoms that we tend to see with children that have sleep and breathing issues. That's exactly what we're gonna be talking about tonight. And Eli is the perfect example of how, just by moving, allowing the oral cavity to perform in the proper position, will allow the proper restful sleep that we want a child to receive, as well as increasing the airway. So this is what we'll be talking about. Um, again, let's talk about airway. What, what is normal, what is not normal? Here are two separate five-year-olds. The child on the left has a restricted or constricted airway. Um, you'll find 21% of the children will have a compromised airway in a vertical position. Obviously, CEPHs, CBCT scanners, all um, are in a vertical position. So as we say, this is gonna be the best of the scenarios. As a individual lies down, that will tend to relax the muscles and obviously the tendency for the airway to close would be greater um, in a horizontal position. You look at the um, five-year-old on the right and you'll see that you have a normal airway, something that looks more like a garden hose. What are the effects of mouth breathing? Same patient um, has a large airway on the left-hand side. Look what happens when they open their mouth a half an inch to mouth breathe. You can see that the airway is reduced by six millimeters. So that's the problem with mouth breathing and that's why we um, find that a critical component of this discussion and obviously something that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, another way to kind of explain the airway and how small it is, well, um, if you take the top of the pinky of the child, that typically will represent how big that child's airway is. Um, here is a seven-year-old with a seven millimeter airway. This is the amount of volume or airspace that they have. It's not that big. Now, if they're a mouth breather, we already know they're gonna eliminate six millimeters and be less left with one millimeter. So let's look down here. Here's a millimeter. It's almost the size of a pinhead, isn't it? And they're only getting 11% of airflow. So those are really good um, visuals for a parent to understand visuals that are great for us as well. Um, here's an interesting case. So obviously when we look at a um, individual, a child, um, there are definite norms or averages that we know about to determine um, where a child falls in the development or the size of their airway. And that measurement is um, 
um, determined by the age of the patient starting at age five multiplied by 10. So this particular child here is a nine-year-old. So we would anticipate nine, the age nine times 10, we would anticipate a 90 square millimeter airway. Well, as you can see, this child is compromised. They only have a 53.6. Well, as a child develops at age 17 is where we typically peak in our airway development, meaning that an airways a size would be anywhere between 150 and 170 square millimeters. Here's the bad news. At age 21, our airway starts to deteriorate and it deteriorates for the rest of our lives. So looking at this particular patient who came in who was already deficient to begin with, was given the first appliance in the Healthy Start treatment, wore it for one month, they're still in the process of treatment, and we took a second CBCT scan with the habicorrector in the mouth. And we were able to measure 337 square millimeters. Well, not only is that six times larger than what we originally measured, but it is over double what we would ever anticipate seeing at the peak of adulthood. What does that mean? That means, wow. <laughs> If we're able to create an airway at 337, holy smokes, that kid is good to go. I mean, can you imagine what a change that would be for the rest of their life? So often we talk about adults that have sleep apnea and we realize that their airways are more compromised. But the question has been, where were they at age 17? Did they ever make it to our goal of 150 to 170 square millimeters? We don't know. We don't know if 150 to 170 is not an accurate measurement because it can't sustain us for the rest of the li our lives. We don't know that information. Um, we're actually involved in about six different research projects in order to evaluate that because this is such an important and critical topic and understanding what we're doing, how we're developing, the stability of that development and what that means over the lifetime of that child. So hopefully, um, not next weekend, but hopefully in the near future, I'll have more of those answers. But that's such an amazing, that, that, that was my aha moment. Hopefully you're having a few tonight um, as well. So here again are just some of the parameters of what we just talked about in regard to the development and um, the measurements of those airways. So let's kind of recap. Um, we had talked about mouth breathing and snoring, and typically that's the result of extended bottle feeding and pacifier use. Um, it causes poor tongue position and abnormal swallowing. Um, sugar and processed foods can have an effect Poor oral habits, thumb, finger, lip sucking, tongue thrust. And mouth breathing basically converts into a compromised airway. And a compromised airway reduces the airway, restricts airflow, reduces oxygen, increases CO2, affects brain function, immune and endocrine systems, swollen adenoids and tonsils, low tongue position, tongue thrust, underdeveloped dental arches, overjet, open bite, and even crossbite. And a compromised airway basically moves into sleep disorder breathing. And the outward symptoms of sleep disorder breathing include restless sleep, ADD, ADHD, bedwetting, chronic allergies, nightmares, daytime drowsiness, et cetera. Um, those top 27 outward symptoms that we saw on the sleep questionnaire. An interesting study that basically looked at MRIs and how sleep affects um, the brain activity. So the first series of three images are three MRIs um, of a normal brain function with a normal night's sleep. The last three are the brain function with one night of sleep deprivation. Not very much brain activity. Um, we see a little bit right here. So imagine the impact that um, deprived sleep, interrupted sleep, um, compromised sleep makes in a patient in regard to basically their brain activity as well as their neurological abilities. 
So let's talk about Healthy Start and what we can do and how we treat. Um, Healthy Start is a division of Orthotain, and Orthotain has been around for 51 plus years, and we've treated over 4 million children. So hopefully we know what we do. Um, I always say the best mind is the mind that's open and is always pushing for further and further information, research, development. So hopefully that's part of the description of Healthy Start because that's exactly what we are looking for. When we look at the series and the treatment protocol, typically each child is gonna wear anywhere from two to three appliances during the treatment. And the initial appliance usually starts always with the habit corrector and it does exactly what the name says. So for instance, if you have a child who's five years of age, um, we would start out with the Healthy Start Kids system. So this would be the system that those kids would be utilizing. They would initially start out with the Healthy Start Kids Have a Corrector. They would transition into the second appliance, which is primarily designed for the primary dentition, moving into adult dentition, and it is called the C-Series. And the final appliance, the third appliance, is the Healthy Start IG or G appliance. And it's basically set up in the mixed dentition. So each one of these is going to be addressing the habits, which is in the first. The second is guiding, developing, promoting the growth and development, as well as correcting any overbite, overjet, open bite, cross bite, class three, um, with only nighttime wear. And the third and final is for the mixed dentition. Usually it's introduced when the laterals start to erupt and it will continue. What's also interesting is these appliances will promote the expansion of the upper arch. And how it does it is basically twofold. The habit corrector will start the expansion. I'll show you in a minute where the tabs are to create that expansion. But then the next two appliances are going to help direct, guide, and in, basically encourage the teeth to erupt in straight. So as a rotated tooth is coming, the appliance captures that tooth, rotates it, allows it to develop into the proper position, but most importantly, puts natural pressure on the adjacent teeth so that we gain the expansion that we would anticipate between primary and permanent dentition. That is four millimeters. And typically we can get two or thereabouts with a habit corrector. So you're looking at our maximum amount, if we catch them at the ideal time, is 6.7 millimeters of arch expansion. So it is considerable. Is it everything that we would be able to cover every child? Probably not, but it's, it's a very small percentage that we see that are above those measurements. However, if we catch a child later in life, is there more likelihood that we might have to do some type of adjunct to the system in order to increase that arch expansion? It's possible. So we wanna make sure we're treating as early as possible. We can get the most effect with these appliances. So let's kind of recap again. Healthy Start addresses root causes by expanding the dental arches, establishing nasal breathing, training the tongue, eliminating bad habits, advancing the mandible to correct over jet, encouraging proper facial growth and development, and corrects most orthodontic problems. So the first appliance which we talked about is called the habit corrector, and this has built-in myofunctional therapy. And how this works is basically there are features within the habit corrector that basically promotes these different areas and corrects the habits, promotes proper habits. So here these palatal tabs are used to start the expansion. The tongue presses against these as it flattens, it starts the expansion of the arch. Um, these lower prongs here prevent the tongue thrust. It also indicates the proper time to swallow. We have what we call a lingual shelf. It's almost like a ramp. So as a child swallows, the tongue is lifted and placed in that proper position that we talked about. We also have what we call lingual tabs. So as you saw in the Eli video, his lower chin drifted back. 
with this appliance, it keeps it in that forward position and it doesn't allow it to retrieve. Obviously, we have a margin that prevents the mouth breathing, encourages the nasal breathing. We do ask the child to seal their lips. If they can't do it at the beginning, they keep working on it. At the same time, if we have an open bite, we might add pads to this that will help close that bite more quickly. Um, talking about swallowing, we want to see how a child swallows, so we indicate how we're improving it with the habit corrector. We would ask the child to take a glass of water. Please don't tell them you're going to watch them swallow. You'll end up with the craziest swallows you've ever seen. Just have them be more natural and just identify. Typically when a child or even an adult swallows, the only part of movement should occur in the neck area. However, if a child has an improper swallow, you'll see movement in the lower third. And usually it's grimaces, um, movement, you'll, you'll know right away. And this is something that you will note and every appointment you'll keep observing and you'll see the changes that occur. As I said, the smile functional therapy, all those features we talked about are actually activated by a swallow. So typically we swallow one time a minute at night and two times a minute during the day. So just by wearing the appliance at night, we're repeating that habit almost 500 times each and every night. So it's a, a very efficient and changes occur very quickly. Um, a study was done on over about approximately 220 patients and we basically watched them for five months and we recorded the degrees and the percentages of changes. Um, this is a guideline for you and the um, treating doctors so that we kind of know where we would anticipate your patient being um, in the percentage of corrections over a period of a certain time of months. Um, if we do not see that, these are concerns that we want you to reach back out to us. Remember, we are your partner. We will collaborate with you. We want to make sure that each and every patient that comes into the Healthy Start treatment is going to be handled as um, to identify, to promote, to gain the greatest amount of um, correction treatment that we can and give every benefit to that child. So let's take the condition of headaches. Um, out of a sample of 220, we saw that 18% experienced headaches. That means that 40 children out of the study were having headaches every morning. Now, 98% of the cases had improvement over five months. 94 mean correction of those with improvement. 91% mean correction of the entire sample. 85% of cases with 100% correction. So you can kind of see as we go through these outward symptoms that we outline in the sleep questionnaire, you can see what kind of improvements you should anticipate within about a five month period of time. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that the child is on average and um, we're not missing anything else that might be occurring. Um, ADD and ADHD, um, as we all know, it's an epidemic. Um, I don't, uh, we all know, we all know kids that are have been diagnosed on medication, um, should have been diagnosed, not on medication. Um, the, the, the stories go on and on. What is interesting is obviously ADD and ADHD is not a blood test. It's a list of criteria that the child needs to um, exhibit and then um, the diagnosis is made on that condition. Well, what is interesting is that list of criteria is the same list of criteria that we use to identify sleep disorder breathing. Can those two um, symptoms or those two conditions be um, misdiagnosed? Absolutely. So when we talk about ADD and ADHD, we typically say it's really important to identify and ensure um, and investigate the sleep issues prior to going down other routes. If we can identify, address, treat, let's see where the child falls. Maybe all of those symptoms will alleviate. Maybe partially they will eliminate. Uh, we can't gauge it. The most current research says 85% of the children with ADD and ADHD had sleep issues. That's not a good statistic. 
So again, evaluate sleep first. Um, one of the biggest studies that have occurred was with a woman named Karen Bonick. Um, she actually um, studied over 13,000 children and her results included that sleep disorder breathing increases the risk of ADD and ADHD by at least 50%. ADD and ADHD patients have little or no REM sleep, but have Delta sleep. Patients without ADD or ADHD have primarily REM sleep and Delta sleep. ADHD and ADD was present in 25.2% of the cases that were in that study of 500 children. Kind of gives you an idea. Um, here, here are two statistics that's important to note. Um, Long-term effects in regard to ADD and ADHD, 50% of the children that have been diagnosed with ADD and ADHD are held back one grade. 30% are held back two grades. Well, I have news for you. If the child has sleep issues, I could hold them back 10 grades and it's still gonna be the same scenario. So again, these are terrible statistics and um, whatever we can do to prevent any child from being held back any amount of grades is beneficial. Um, also children who had sleep disorder breathing, we find that their IQs are basically affected and are lowered by 10 to 20 points. What does that mean? Well, sometimes in my world, I look at it college or no college. They went one step further and they actually put a price tag on an IQ point. And that price tag was $170,000 during the lifetime of that child. It's a lot of money, a lot of loss effort, a lot of changes in a child's life. If we could only identify it earlier, treat it, make more permanent changes for that child, imagine where that child would be. We sometimes say, let's eliminate the barriers that affect our child. Let them grow to their potential. Let's see what we change. One of them, who knows, could be the person who discovers the cure for cancer. Um, these are things we should be thinking about and obviously things that we should be educating parents about. So Healthy Start actually promotes growth and development as well. As we know in the craniofacial growth, majority of the growth is completed at age 12. Um, the growth is forward and down. We're looking to promote that same natural growth with the Healthy Start appliances. At age 12, we know that 89% of the males will be completed, 94% of females. Again, if you see it, treat it, earlier the better. Again, based on the habits, the um, development of the child, and the craniofacial growth. Healthy, here's a case that actually was treated with Healthy Start. You can see before and after. You can see the forward growth that occurred. This child was treated for about a year and a half. And um, you can see that the mandibular advancement created 54% more growth and development. This is typically what we see in patients that need that forward growth of the mandible. We also have appliances that will be able to move both the maxilla and the mandible in conjunction with each other. So we're able to improve the profile, expand the airway, and promote that forward growth and development. Um, we have a Max-A corrector, which is the appliance that we use to pro basically promote that forward growth of up both the upper and lower arch. So if we look at this appliance, you'll see there's no frontal wall on the appliance. And there are three tear, or tabs in the rear of the appliance. The patient will actually push on those tabs. The upper arch is free to make that movement forward. And the appliance is designed to allow the lower jaw to move in unison. Very clever, happens very quickly, typically two to four months. Um, they do come in two sizes. We can start as early as age two. Typically, we say most effective up until age 12. We have had adults use this. Um, again, I don't know how well the body's going to react. So, you know, we, we don't have as much statistics as I would like to be able to give you a, 
absolute answer. Maybe there isn't really an absolute answer in an adult. It's just how the body is going to react after the age of 12. Um, class three, obviously, when we have that lower arch impacting the upper arch, we tend to see deficiency in growth in the middle or mid-face section. Um, how do we determine a pseudo class three versus a skeletal class three? Well, typically the easiest way is as the child bites down, if they bite end to end and then slide, we call that a pseudo class three. If they open and bite directly into a class three, that's probably a skeletal class three. So the Healthy Start class three um, corrector can basically address and correct the pseudo class three. With a skeletal class three, we can minimize those outward um, appearances and obviously the um, restriction in growth. Um, the way the appliance works is very similar to the Max A, except that there is a lower bumper in the lower region, which is going to stabilize the lowers as we promote the upper arch and make that jump. It's funny, once we make that jump, it's kind of like we restarted growth and we see that growth and development continuing in that same direction. Obviously, you can see a case here that was used with it. It does happen very quickly. Again, typically two to four months. Treatment planning with the Healthy Start, we will um, assist you in identifying treating um, these children. We do have a diagnostic form, um, a diagnosis service where these forms are submitted into a portal. We have doctors that will help evaluate the cases and provide suggested treatment plans, which you are absolutely welcome to discuss, use, um, however you want to utilize them in your practice. But it's that extra consultant that you have in your office. Um, many times um, doctors have not worked on children this young. Maybe they have not been um, exposed to sleep disorder breathing. They're a little hesitant that they identified this correctly. These are all things that will help in the treatment planning for these patients and give you that confidence um, and the educational experience to feel that you are giving the best to your patient, but you are learning that um, along the way. Now let's do some of the fun things. Let's look at some of the cases. So as we go through, here's a seven-year-old boy. You can see how many outward symptoms they have. This is considerable. Um, this is probably 17 or 18, I believe. Also look um, at the bottom here. His speech was very delayed, didn't say many words up until age three or four. Now, we asked the parent three months later to do a follow-up of where that child is. You can see the zeros and some ones here. So obviously great improvement. Now let's look at the case and see what the orthodontic conditions look like and what the facial um, profile. So as you can see, um, this is March, 2015. Look at the deep overbite. Um, sometimes doctors say 100%, sometimes we do it in millimeters. Look at the square arch you can see how compromised that child is. Now let's look at him as he progresses. This is March of 2015. Here we are a little bit more than a year later. Take a look at the overbite, beautiful. Look at the round arches, beautiful. Look at the facial changes of that child. It's considerable. Looks like almost a totally different kid. Here, the follow through, here's the year later. You can see how the teeth have settled in. Um, you can see how um, symmetrical his face are. Look at how beautiful those rounded arches are. Um, tongue is in the right position, and we see the changes that happened in his sleep questionnaire. Here's another case, same kind of deal. You can see threes, fours, twos, ones. Here's a five. Um, you can see three months later, I think all zero. Here's a one. But you can see tremendous changes that occurred. 100% um, overbite, you can see the improvement. This child is not completed, you'll see the rest of the teeth, but it gives you an idea of where we're progressing. Here's a third case, you can see here's the initial, here's the finish, why don't we compare them? Here's the beginning, here's the end, beautiful case. Number four, you can see the progress, how the appliance looks, it's, it's seated in the mouth, very, very deep bite, 
In the appliance, permanent teeth start to erupt. They're erupted at angles. The appliance captures it. Here they look at the finished. Here they are in the appliance, the final appliance. Here's another case, beginning to end. Another case, initial, finish. Here's an interesting patient. Um, this little girl's mom um, had many of these characteristics as a child. She ended up in her late 30s having jaw surgery. Um, she realized, identified the same symptoms as her child, so she wanted to obviously um, address them as early as possible. So you can see the rolled lip, you can see the diminished growth in that lower third, you can see the circles under their eyes. Remember I told you about that double chin kind of look? Um, take a look at the deep bite. You can see square arches. Let's see how she progresses. So remember what she looks like. How different. No double chin, look at the circles. I mean, the whole facial structure has changed so dramatically. Look at her case. Um, the overbite has been corrected. The arches are rounded. Now, remember I told you, because we start so early, the fiber bundles develop into that position, the habits are corrected, that we have very permanent results. And the reason being is because we've addressed it early. We use the fiber bundles or the development of them as our retainer for life. There is no conflict with oral habits because we've already addressed them. So let's see how she's, her result and the stable um, ization of those results. Here she is. Here she is, this older. So you can see how we maintain those corrections. Here's another child, snores, brucks, bad breath, ear infection. One year later, actually this child patient is from Alaska. Here's another child, eight and a half. You can see the outward symptoms. Um, we have a couple fives, um, zeros, ones, obviously speech issues as well. Deep bite, um, square arch. You can see this is about a year later, rounded arches, most importantly changes that occurred. And this is only progress. Obviously we'll want to see the rest of the teeth develop so we can finalize that case. Here's another one, had a spectrum of outward symptoms, snored, brux. I wanna show you mid-treatment and 14 years later. Here's mid-treatment, 14 years later, how stable that case is. Um, we have an app that helps with compliance. Maybe you're sitting here, oh, oral appliances. How bad is compliance? Actually, we have 94% compliance. We have tricks of the trade. These are easy appliances for the kids to wear. Um, I, I, it's probably hard to believe, but more frequently my prob our problem is at age 12, they don't wanna give up their appliances. So this way we are able to address, um, provide them with something that's soft, squishy. Sometimes we refer to the appliance as a pillow for their teeth. They like that idea, it gives them a sense of security. They like how the pillow feels on their head and therefore the fear factor or the ability to test it becomes um, more of a game and something they look forward to. Um, the app is great, it helps track compliance. Um, every night when the child wakes up, it will ask, did you wear the appliance last night? Did it stay in all night? It will ask the mom to identify any changes from the initial sleep questionnaire. It will reward the child with a coin that they can deposit in the bank to accumulate in order to buy prizes. They also receive 30 minutes of game time, reading a book, different items that help motivate. And every Friday, we will give each patient cheek retractors and they will take a selfie. So we'll end up with a flip book, sort of like this, a flip book that will basically show you all those changes that occur in a patient. So it's a great motivating device for parents and their um, children. It's a great form of marketing because parents like to share with other parents and all of this information is brought back to your own practice. So even though you're not seeing that child month to month or every six weeks, you will still have records of their progress and what they're doing when you're not seeing them in your office. So it's an amazing tool. Again, we've treated over 4 million cases. Um, we take safety um, of our appliance very seriously. 
All of our appliance is regulated to a class two medical device. We only need to regulate to a class one, but we want you to understand how serious we take the safety of your patient. Um, class two medical device means I can take the appliance, put it in your body, and you should be safe. Obviously, we wouldn't do that, but we want you to understand how um, serious we take um, the safety of our appliances. All of our appliances are FDA cleared, made in the USA, no latex, no plasticizers, no silicone. All appliances are BPA, BPS free, phthalate free. So um, please understand safety is our uh, utmost concern. Mm -hmm.